Okay, well, it looks like we gained a few more people. And thank you all for joining our roundtable on pharmacy benefit managers and laboratory benefit managers. I'm Claire Saxton, Vice President of Patient Experience here at Cancer Support Community. And um, I'm moderating on behalf of the Cancer Support Community's Cancer Policy Institute, which is the policy and advocacy arm of CSC or Cancer Support Community. This roundtable is part of CSC's Forum on Utilization Management. Now in its fourth year, the forum was created to foster thoughtful discussion that engage a broad range of healthcare stakeholders and keep the focus on patients, ask tough and nuanced questions about when various UM approaches are acceptable and when they have the potential to harm patient health outcomes, as well as to identify new ideas and promising practices that optimize evidence-based health care. CSC is committed to fostering conversations that inform and engage all stakeholders in the creation and implementation of UM strategies that include the patient perspective and incentivize cost efficiency through improved patient care and outcomes. Before we begin, I just want to touch on a few housekeeping items. If you have any technical or administrative difficulties, please let us know by using the chat box that's at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to address them. We'll be recording today's roundtable to allow those who cannot join us to listen to the presentations and discussions at a later date. And we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the speaker presentations please submit questions into the Q&A box, which is separate from the chat box. Um, and you're able to submit those questions in that Q&A box throughout the presentations. And we'll do our best to get them, to get to all of your questions during today's Q&A session. I also wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, GSK, Janssen, Merck, Novartis, Pfizer, and Sanofi. And whether you are a patient, caregiver, patient advocate, payer, an employer, or with an industry partner, we are all here today because we believe we have a role to play in making healthcare accessible, affordable, and high quality. We're honored to be joined today by three great speakers to offer their various perspectives on benefit managers. I want to start by introducing Adam Borden. Adam is currently the Senior Vice President of Policy and Strategy at the American Clinical Laboratory Association. Adam has had quite a diverse career in healthcare and has developed deep knowledge and understanding of federal health policy provider reimbursement, and the changing landscape of healthcare delivery in the U.S. In addition to uh, the ACLA, Adam has been Vice President of Market Access and Reimbursement at Clearly, Inc. He spent five years at Siemens Health and Years. He's served as chair of the Reimbursement Committee at the Medical Imaging and Technology Alliance and chair of the Diagnostic Payment Workgroup at AdvaMed DX. Adam has also been a vice president in Avalier Health. And um, he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Rutgers University and a Master's of Health Administration degree from A.T. Still University of Health Sciences. Welcome, Adam. I will turn it over to you. Great, well, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, let me share my screen we get going. Okay. All right, slides look good. They look great, thank you. Okay, excellent. Great, so, uh, so thank you again for the, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I'm gonna start by speaking about uh, laboratory benefit managers. Um, you know, I think uh, most people have heard of pharmacy benefit managers, maybe radiology benefit managers, uh, but the laboratory uh, testing environment 
is uh, maybe not one of the newer sort of areas that that payers are looking to uh, to manage, but uh, it's certainly one with uh, the sort of advance of precision medicine uh, and genetics that has really sort of come to the forefront uh, when we start to think about how uh, uh, potentially costs can be contained, but uh, also how uh, they, they can essentially manage, you know, uh, uh, whether patients are getting the right test at the right time. Um, so laboratory benefit management is another sort of uh, uh, important sort of area of, of utilization management that again is sort of growing. And sort of, I'll, I'll take you back in time a little bit to uh, sort of the early 2000s. I think it was April 2003 that the uh, human genome, the complete human genome was, was mapped, or at least I think it was 92% of it. Uh, I think the other 8% was filled in over the, over the next couple of decades. But um, you know, early 2000s, the human genome was mapped. And so over the next 10, 15, 20 years, we've seen this rapid advancement in uh, linking uh, genomics and genetics to particular diseases, uh, utilizing uh, genetic, uh, uh, genetic sort of uh, uh, markers in drug development, uh, tying them as companion diagnostics to certain therapies. It's been a real advancement in uh, the use of laboratory testing, in particular, the advancement of genetics in uh, the management of diseases, uh, in particular cancer. And so that sort of happened again over the next 15 or so years. Um, there were changes with the advancement again in linking uh, diagnostic and genetic testing to, uh, to clinical uh, outcomes. There were changes in how laboratories and providers are reimbursed for, uh, for those services. And so uh, that sort of happened in the early 2010s. There were a lot of changes in, in the, uh, the CPT coding, sort of how, uh, how these uh, services were identified to payers in claims. Um, and they were receiving a lot, of, uh, a lot of, of claims for these services that they really didn't know much about or didn't know what they were for uh, because it was still being included in, in guidelines and sort of pushed into, into clinical care. And so laboratory benefit managers really started to take shape or at least started to grow in interest from the payer community, uh, sort of in the mid-2010s. The mid, uh, now, the, the laboratory benefit management has been around uh, probably since the late 1990s, early 2000s. But again, it was, it was uh, uh, something that was really a bit more niche, uh, maybe more focused on just managing routine testing and the laboratories that were within the network of the payer. Um, but it's really grown uh, in, the, in the last sort of decade um, uh, from the payer community as, again, uh, more genetics has been involved in clinical care and as reimbursement has changed uh, and, and needed to be addressed uh, going forward. So we look at sort of, you know, what is an, an LBM uh, and, and who are they? And so similar to other ban benefit management, uh, they are contracted organizations that really manage uh, a, a benefit for a health plan. And when we think about laboratory services, there's not a specific laboratory benefit like there is for pharmacy versus medical benefits in, in terms of, of what a health plan covers, right? It's really part of the medical benefit. So it's not its own benefit. However, it is sort of a, a unique area um, of, of services that involves uh, a number of different sort of providers or suppliers, including the laboratory itself, which could be a hospital-based laboratory, it could be an independent clinical laboratory, um, it, it could be sort of a small community-based laboratory. You have the physician who's actually ordering the tests and sending those orders to the, the laboratory to be, um, uh, to be supplied. Uh, and then those results are then sent back to the physician. And then you have the payer, right, who's actually paying for that laboratory test. Um, so it's essentially managing that relationship uh, and the tests that are ordered by physicians, sent to labs, and then billed to the payer. A really it's contracted organization uh, that manages sort of those, those services for the, for the plan. It's mainly, I'd say the, the more recent or sort of focus over the last decade or so has really been on uh, molecular and specialty laboratory services. Again, sort of going through that, you know, the rise of sort of genetic testing. I think it was, um, I looked back at sort of 2018 and Medicare payments for laboratory services as a whole. Um, 
<clears throat> the growth in laboratory services, 98% of lab payment growth from Medicare was genetic services, right? So it's really just, you've seen this huge uptick in uh, spending on genetic services as more tests come to market, as there's more, again, clinical uh, utility for genetic testing. Uh, but obviously it's, it's become a, a, a higher spend area for, for the payers. Um, however, it's not only for molecular and genetic services. We've seen some LVMs recently uh, and over the years sort of focus again on managing just routine services. So if you're doing thyroid testing, right, maybe the, uh, the plan only wants to pay for two thyroid tests instead of a panel of, of seven. Um, and maybe they sort of, you know, or want to control certain spending that might be, um, uh, that they might start seeing in, uh, in some of the orders that sort of come into them and some of the claims, the payer claims that come into them. <clears throat> they work mostly with uh, the private insurer books of business. So that could be the commercial plans, Medicare Advantage, uh, Medicaid managed care organizations. It's not active or LBMs are not active in original Medicare. However, there are the Medicare contractors that uh, develop coverage policies <coughs> for, uh, for services, right, medical services, including laboratory tests. And so while it's not something that would be utilization management from a, say, prior authorization perspective in original Medicare, uh, there are certainly a lot of coverage policies, uh, particularly through a program called MOLDEX, which <coughs> operates in 28 states. Um, and really is focused on developing coverage policies and analyzing uh, genetic and molecular testing for the Medicare program and develop, again, developing coverage policies for them. But that's not something where you would submit a prior authorization, you get the authorization or not. It's something where a physician orders the test, it, it's performed, it's billed to Medicare, uh, and the, again, the lab or the provider have to sort of understand the um, uh, the, uh, the coverage policy and all of the clinical sort of pieces of that uh, without sort of getting some type of authorization in advance. <clears throat> um, so what do they do? So just like other benefit managers, right, they may develop prior authorization policies and coverage policies. Uh, they may actually perform those prior authorization services, uh, which you've seen again in, in, in pharmacy benefit managers, you may have seen it with radiology and sort of imaging services. Uh, they may perform utilization review on particular suppliers, labs, physicians, <clears throat> and uh, again, medical necessity determination. So whether it's medically necessary or not for that patient based on their own guidelines. Uh, there are, they, they also uh, designate uh, or can designate a sort of network of preferred laboratories, uh, which could be routine testing laboratories, specialty molecular laboratories, um, but they may designate and have sort of a, a network of, of laboratories that they then um, include in their sort of, uh, uh, I guess, offerings to the, to the health plan. They do provide provider education from time to time, uh, and they also may do some claims review. So that's sort of post-payment review of claims um, uh, as a service to the, to the provider or to the health plan. So examples are uh, uh, Evacor Healthcare, which is a large benefit manager. Um, they were acquired by Express Scripts in 2017, which was acquired by Cigna in 2018. So again, a health plan actually owns this benefit manager. Uh, and they work with uh, Highmark, Various Blues, Molina Healthcare, some others uh, to manage laboratory benefits. Um, and again, I'd say that a health plan doesn't have to purchase all of those services in the what do they do. They may only use them to develop coverage policies or just to set up a network of laboratories. So there's sort of different levels of services that they may utilize. Um, there's AIM Specialty Healthcare, another benefit manager that's been around, does radiology benefit management. Um, again, they're also owned by a payer, which was, uh, they were bought by WellPoint, which was then Anthem and is now Elevance uh, in 2007. Again, work with a number of, of commercial health plans. Um, Avalon Healthcare Solutions, which is a private company, uh, I believe it is, it has a partnership or may be owned by uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, um, but they work with var various blues and then they have a new partnership with, uh, with Optum, uh, which also owns OptumRx, which is the pharmacy benefit manager. 
Um, and then Optum, again, sort of just mentioning them, uh, they have recently launched, launched a laboratory benefit management service, uh, which again, partners with Avalon and also partners with that Moldex program that is actually run by a Medicare contractor uh, that I mentioned before. So they've rec recently launched a lab benefit management service um, and they're looking to pair that with their Optum RX pharmacy benefit management service. So really starting to think about where else can we manage benefits, right? What else can we sort of try to, uh, uh, try to work with health plans to, um, to manage and, and, and impact in terms of a sort of a cost or utilization uh, perspective. So, you know, I, I'm not someone who wants to come in here and say LBMs are all bad. Right, uh, they're they're terrible. I think there are some positives for uh, that that benefit management sort of brings to the uh, brings to the table. Right, you want to make sure that labs are high quality, and I think they do a good job of evaluating laboratories in terms of their quality. Um, there's other things that could be positive in terms of you know, ensuring the patient gets the right test, and there's not you know, tests that are unnecessary that are uh, that are being ordered. However, their client is the health plan, right? And so what are they looking to do? And there's a sort of snippet from Evacor Healthcare's website. You know, yes, they want to improve the quality of care, but really it's reducing genetic testing costs. It's reducing costs to the payer is what the real focus of, of benefit management uh, ultimately is. Um, and it's no different for lab benefit management. Um, again, sort of focusing in on that, their, their client is the health plan. And that's really who they're there, they're there to serve. Uh, and so that could lead to some potential issues. Um, it could be delays in care, right? Prior authorization review times can vary. So if there is prior authorization on certain testing, if that takes a week, sometimes that's a long time um, for a cancer patient to wait for testing results. Communication delays between providers. Uh, again, the provider is the one who's usually communicating with the, uh, with the laboratory benefit manager. Uh, going through the prior authorization process, it's not usually the patient, but there can be communication delays and that can lead to a delay in care. And a lot of the care, especially with cancer patients, uh, is, is based off of testing results. So you could have a laboratory test that then is delayed um, or, or leads to some delay and that leads to a delay in imaging and that leads to a delay in treatment. And so that's something that always could happen when you have sort of a a, a third party sort of uh, in between the actual care provider, the testing results and the treatment. Uh, and again, that's a scary time for patients, right? To wait for that. Uh, and so we, we certainly want to minimize any uh, additional uh, uh, sort of fear in terms of the, the patient. Um, it could also override physician patient decision making. So the physician may have discussed all of the testing options with the patient, the patient may say, that sounds great, let's get that done. But then half of it may not get done because the LBM denies it, um, says it's not medically necessary, maybe isn't as up to speed on the literature as the physician uh, in terms of the benefits of performing this test and what the actual utility of that is. Uh, so that can change testing, it can deny authorization and slows down the process. Um, again, those LBMs are not always updating their policies uh, uh, as new evidence comes out. Sometimes it may be every six months, every year. And so that can uh, lead towards limitations in uh, the timing for new innovative tests to be uh, covered by those payers or, or uh, included in LBM guidelines. Um, and also they may overlook really important key specialty laboratory providers that really are the only ones that perform a certain test that is really important to that patient's care. And if they're not in the network of this LBM, again, that could be a potential issue that uh, denies access to that testing for that patient. And then also comorbidities. Now, I think this is something that's really important. Um, cancer patients are undergoing treatment for cancer. However, there's a lot of comorbidities with that. Um, there could be cardiac issues, uh, musculoskeletal, neurological issues that sort of creep up uh, uh, due to treatment or, or other factors. And so if you're not getting tested for a lot of these, these sort of other issues, then they can't be treated as well. And that makes the patient's care uh, suboptimal. So it's another sort of issue that I would just say is, is important. So I'll close by just saying, so what can we do? Um, 
you know, we can help the patient be prepared and really know what to ask. Understand what the physician is ordering um, as a whole, right? All of the testing that the physician is ordering, why it's important for that patient. We want to make sure the patient is ready to ask these questions to their physician um, because if they sort of are talking to their physician, the physician says again, I'm ordering this testing and then half of it doesn't get done because it was denied. We want to make sure the patient understands that. We want to make sure that the physician uh, is, is armed with uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, help or uh, ammunition to, to sort of help uh, get those, those tests performed and paid for by the payer. Um, so it's important to just make sure that the patient is prepared and understands what's happening because uh, they don't always know what's happening on the prior authorization form. Um, focusing on the, the total patient care. So again, there's a lot of lab services that are done for cancer patients, for the cancer itself and for other things. Um, so helping to sort of keep them on track and understanding what they're getting, uh, knowing what to ask their physicians is really important. And then just do what we do best, right? Let's be proactive. Let's continue to advocate for the patient's perspective on the Hill, uh, in local policy, we want to make sure that patients have access to this testing, that the LBMs don't get uh, get sort of, uh, I guess, too bloated, um, too impactful to the patient-physician decision-making. Um, we want to make sure we reduce burden for the providers as well, uh, who are obviously extremely key in, uh, in, in uh, caring for these, these cancer patients. So I'll leave it there and uh, turn it back over to Claire. Thank you so much, Adam. Our next speaker is Greg Year. He's the Better Medicare Alliance's Vice President of Policy and Research. He joined them a year ago and brought nearly 25 years of policy and advocacy experience to that role. Previous to that, uh, he had leadership roles with some of the nation's leading healthcare associations, including the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, Pharma, and the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Greg most recently served as Senior Vice President for Policy at America's Health Insurance Plan, and he began his career on Capitol Hill as an aide to U.S. Senator Christopher Dodd of Connecticut. Greg is a graduate of Providence College and earned his master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University. He has also served on the Cancer Support Community's Cancer Policy Institute Advisory Board. Thank you, Greg. We appreciate you coming today and speaking about uh, pharmacy benefit managers. Thank you, Claire. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really uh, pleased to be here uh, for the Cancer Support Community's annual forum on utilization management. I know today's roundtable is specific focus on the role of UM in delivering prescription drug and lab benefits. Um, so I was going to do a couple of things here um, in my presentation, provide a little bit of the background on kind of the value of utilization management and prior authorization within the healthcare system. Uh, Want to discuss a little bit about how UM and prior authorization are applied and implemented in the Medicare Advantage space, as well as Medicare Part D. And then finally, just talk a little bit about opportunities for reform um, and next steps. Um, just a little bit of background about the Better Medicare Alliance, just so everyone's sort of familiar. We're the leading research and advocacy organizations that's really focused on Medicare Advantage. We're a coalition of 170 plus ally organizations that represent um, health, health systems and health care providers, consumer and patient advocacy organizations, aging service organizations, as well as Medicare Advantage plans. Um, our coalition also includes 600,000 beneficiary advocates and we engage in the legislative and regulatory process to protect and strengthen Medicare Advantage, and then also work with third parties to uh, develop new research on the value of Medicare Advantage. So just a little bit of background about uh, UM, um, and I'm going to be focused really on the Medicare Advantage space, but, you know, obviously, UM is a, you know, very prominent feature of public and private health insurance programs. The, really, the goal is to ensure the patient and beneficiary receives medically necessary care, but it's also, as you know, a cost containment and quality tool. 
Um, prior authorization is probably, um, you know, the most common medical management tool. Um, you know, this is really a tool where a beneficiary's provider works with the health plan to make sure that a certain medical treatment, a medical service, a therapy, or a prescription medicine is the best option for an individual patient's needs. Other kind of you know common UM practices, particularly in the prescription drug space, are of course the use of drug formularies, um, step therapy, quantity limits, and um, generic and therapeutic substitution. And so when we're talking about uh, UM and medical management, the, the rationale really here is to identify um, and discourage costly low value services, which in turn should reduce healthcare spending, but without impairing healthcare quality. Um, UM practices, of course, are you know, subject to extensive regulation and oversight. In the case of Medicare Advantage and Medicare Part D, you know, CMS is the regulator. Uh, they regulate these activities through uh, you know, a variety of, of ways, you know, managed care and prescription drug manual, uh, regulations and guidance, including on you know, formulary design. Um, and all these are kind of articulated both in the law and, and also via the regulatory process. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking about kind of the Medicare Advantage um, experience, um, just a little bit of you know background and data. Uh, you know most beneficiaries are actually enrolled in plans that use prior authorization for at least some services, but interestingly, about one fifth of beneficiaries are enrolled in plans that don't use any prior authorization for any services, and this is according to data from uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation. There's also survey research done by Morning Consult, uh, really looking at the beneficiary experience uh, with, with, uh, with prior authorization. And it reports that less than half of beneficiaries report ever encountering prior authorization, while 6% um, report saying they've encountered prior authorization often. Among that subset of beneficiaries that encountered via prior authorization, a large majority uh, nearly 70% report that it poses you know, no burden on access. There was recently an Office of Inspector General report on Medicare Advantage plans uh, and uh, those kind of practices in some detail. They found that uh, Medicare Advantage plans approve the vast majority of prior authorization requests as well as pro provider payment requests. And uh, just a little more context here. Um, I think when you're thinking about the value of these tools and techniques, um, it's really at looking at low value care. That's care that you know is not providing added value, provides little or no clinical benefit, and increases costs. So a recent report by uh, Injama found that Medicare Advantage actually has fewer instances of low value care as compared to traditional um, Medicare fee for services. That is, you know, tests, treatments, and procedures that provide little or no clinical benefit. Um, and that Medicare Advantage beneficiaries received uh, almost 10% fewer of such services. And so not only is that, you know, a cost imposed on the system, but also can potentially expose beneficiaries to you know, not only wasteful, but potentially harmful care. So really talking about, you know, the value of these services. You know, all that being said, um, and at the same time, you know, policymakers are certainly focused on ways to improve and streamline UM and the prior authorization process. And I know there's kind of, you know, broad stakeholder work on this for many years. Um, I think on the legislative side, important to note um, that bipartisan legislation sponsored by Representative Del Benny of Washington State. Uh, this recently passed the House of Representatives uh, last week unanimously by voice vote. It's the Improving Seniors Access to Timely Care Act. Um, and this is legislation that uh, BMA has supported and has endorsed and has a number of kind of, uh, you know, targeted reforms uh, to prior authorization as it relates to Medicare Advantage. First, it would require uh, electronic prior authorization, which is an important way to kind of streamline the process and reduce uh, burdens on providers. It increases transparency and data collection on the use and the frequency of prior authorization. So kind of all stakeholders have better line of sight about kind of, you know, when and how uh, prior authorization is used. 
It will ensure that prior authorization adheres to evidence-based practice and clinical guidelines, which is just so important. I think the value of these tools are, are only useful in, in, in promoting quality care as long as they're aligned with kind of clinical best practices and not as a cost containment you know, tool. Importantly, the legislation will also create an expedited prior authorization process, which I think is just such a critical piece of this. Uh, you certainly don't want PA to be a barrier to patient care. And so the legislation for the first time uh, creates kind of a real-time decision process for items and services that are routinely approved. Um, on the regulatory front, I would just note that um, CMS is also interested in this area. They recently released um, in late August um, a request for information on improving Medicare Advantage. Um, you know, it was a very comprehensive kind of stakeholder engagement, um, really looking at the administration's strategic plan and pillars around health equity and affordability and access, uh, innovation, and as well as affordability. And, uh, you know, a number of questions of the 100 plus questions that are kind of, uh, you know, part of this um, request for information, a number were actually focused on the issue of medical management and prior authorization. So really shows CMS interest in wanting to learn from all stakeholders, you know, what, what's working well, you know, what can be improved and what could be streamlined. And, you know, from our perspective, um, we certainly believe uh, that these tools uh, have value uh, in improving quality and reducing unnecessary care. But at the same time, you know, we certainly support efforts to streamline and simplify the process so that uh, we can reduce burdens on providers as well as ensure access uh, for patients uh, to needed treatments. So uh, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Claire and um, looking forward to the discussion after our formal presentations. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Greg. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Rachel Klein, Deputy Executive Director at the AIDS Institute. Rachel joined the AIDS Institute, a leading national nonprofit organization that promotes action for social change for people living with HIV and viral hepatitis through public policy, research, advocacy, and education. And Rachel joined them in 2018. She leads the Institute's federal policy work, coordinating advocacy efforts to advance policies that increase access to healthcare and treatment for people living with or at risk for HIV and hepatitis C. Rachel also co-chairs the HIV Healthcare Access Working Group and its member and is a member of the convening group of the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership. She's also a member of the steering committee of the All Copays Count Coalition and the I Am Essential Coalition. Rachel has worked at several nonprofit health policy organizations for more than 20 years in Washington, DC, focusing on increasing access to health insurance coverage and healthcare for at-risk populations. Rachel earned a master's in women's studies and public policy from the George Washington University in Washington, DC, and a BA in political science from the University of California at San Diego. Thanks for joining us today, Rachel. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion. And I think, you know, from, I've, I've been asked to sort of provide a patient perspective. And of course, I always want to make a, a sort of a disclaimer that, you know, patients are all of us. Um, at some point in our lives, almost every single person um, will be a patient who is receiving health care and in need of health care. And so the patient experience is, of course, extremely diverse. Um, and so, you know, no one person can represent the entire patient perspective. Um, when it comes to utilization management, um, there are a number of issues to really consider about how it affects patients. And of course, it depends on what the patient's, what the issue is that has brought the patient in contact with utilization management policy, what the condition is that they have, where their provider is located in the system, what kind of health insurance coverage they have that can really contribute to how that patient experiences utilization management. But a couple of things I just want to sort of bring into the conversation is really a reminder of who patients are. And particularly patients, I want to sort of focus on patients with chronic illness for a lot of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, we kind of have to remember that um, patients are 
people. Um, and most patients are not experts in how our health care system works, how our health insurance system works. And it's a really complicated system. Um, listening to Adam describe the um, LBMs um, and the development and their interactions with all of these different companies and how they relate to insurers and to providers and to the labs themselves, it's a really complicated system. And when you're layering on top of that, um, an LBM, a TBM, um, and a health insurance product, um, a provider network, um, and potentially someone who is engaging with the healthcare system in multiple ways because they may have multiple conditions or they may be the person who is responsible for making sure that their family members get the health care that they need. Um, they're doing it while they're also balancing their regular lives, right? People who um, are engaging in health care are also running their day-to-day -day lives, right? They, they have to juggle their work and their family responsibilities. They may have children that they have to take care of, pets. They have work responsibilities that um, as we all know, have been incredibly challenging, all of that has been incredibly challenging um, in the past few years, um, in addition to, you know, the challenges that we all had faced for, for many years before that, um, because so many things have been in flux. And so people have a lot going on in their lives. And when they or their family members, um, their kids, their elderly parents are ill, there's an extra layer of stress on top of that. Um, and so people are really having to learn a lot about the particular healthcare condition, the treatment that they're talking about with their providers, the tests that, or surgeries or other sorts of interventions um, or steps along the diagnostic journey that they're going on. Um, and it's all a very stressful environment, especially when you're not um, an expert in all of the different machinations um, and different things that are going on. So when patients are in contact um, in this process and they have to, and they meet up with um, a utilization management um, policy like prior authorization or step therapy, it often adds an extra layer of hurdle for the patient um, to grapple with. Um, and these extra hurdles can result in delays of care. Um, and sometimes those delays of care um, can be very important um, if the delay is um, a critical test that is needed in order to um, get started on a treatment, if the delay um, is a treatment that you're starting um, or trying to start, or if it is um, a prior authorization that has come up because your, um, your health insurance plan year um, has ended, and now you have an, uh, maybe you have changed health insurance plans, are starting a new one and you're already on a treatment, um, uh, a prior authorization requirement can interrupt your ability to get a prescription filled um, or to continue on a course of treatment for a condition um, that you have or that a member of your family has. And these things can be not only very disruptive and time consuming to resolve administratively, um, but they can also result in lost opportunity for care, backsliding of a, or worsening of a condition um, that can create extra costs in the healthcare system and for individuals. Um, a lot of times, you know, these the the need to go through a step therapy process um, can happen um, can really while it is not always a detriment, and I would agree with Greg that there is some value um, in the system, it really depends on how it is being implemented. And all too often, what we're hearing from patients is that these utilization management strategies seem to be um, applied in a way to save costs rather than to assist the patient and ensure that they're getting the highest quality care. We tend to come into contact with prior authorization or step therapy, not when there is a low cost um, uh, treatment that we are trying to access. We come into contact with it when there's a high cost treatment. Um, and so, you know, frequently these are barriers that will delay access 
to that high cost treatment um, and may, in the case of step therapy, require that um, an older drug um, or therapy that is not as effective as a newer one um, is used. And that at, can actually um, cause significant issues as well because it may delay the ability of a patient to get to the care that they need. Now, I think that it is really important to note um, that we all want to make sure that patients get the best care that they can um, and that there are roles for, there is role for oversight in the healthcare system to make sure that patients are on the best course of treatment and that their providers are prescribing the best course of treatment and making sure that they have access. Um, to the test, but there is a lot of administrative burden that is very, very challenging for patients and can really get in the way. And we know that people who are um, in the midst of these um, very complex um, conditions can get really derailed from the care that they need by extra administrative burdens and the people will end up walking away from the system um, or needing to put in a lot of extra time that they simply don't have um, to figure out um, how to how to make it through and how to make sure that their um, that that the course of action that they have decided on with their provider um, is the one that they end up getting. Um, the other thing I wanted to just touch on um, is that you know all all too often what we are hearing from folks. Um, is that utilization management um, really does interrupt their ability to um, get to get the um, treatments that their providers um, have requested. And part of that issue is communication breakdowns, right? Patients are often sort of getting a, a prescription or a referral from a provider that they then maybe are taking to a pharmacy um, and then they have to stand in line at the pharmacy, drop off the prescription, you know, wait for that prescription to be filled only to find out um, that there is a prior authorization, um, that the, the prescription has been denied by the insurer because of, it has gotten prior authorization um, or because there is a step therapy or other kind of um, utilization management attached to it. Then the patient has to go to figure out what is the issue here. They may have to then call the insurance company, um, talk to the insurance company and try to figure out um, why the prescription was denied. Then they may have to go back to their provider, try to get in touch with a provider to have the provider do the prior authorization um, request. All of that is, an ex is a really time consuming um, and confusing venture that requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of follow through um, and um, and determination for people to overcome the hurdles. And the problem that we've experienced um, is that it really is up to the patient to then become an advocate and to figure out how all of these systems interact and to be the communicator between their provider, their insurer, um, their pharmacist, their lab, whichever of these components of the system are involved. Um, and that really does add um, an unfortunate extra burden to patients who, as I said, are already going through a time of their life where they may not have, if they, are, if they themselves are the individual um, who, is who is dealing with a health issue, they may not have the energy level um, or the physical ability um, and, the, and the mental and emotional stamina um, to really grapple with these extra burdens. So I just think it's important to pay attention to um, how, how all of this is playing out and where the patient um, is in the system and how we are providing assistance to patients to make sure that any extra hurdles that are provided um, that, are, that are placed in their way are A, very necessary to making sure they can get the care, that they aren't standing in the way of that care. Um, and we really need to find some ways to improve that communication so that patients aren't sort of left holding the bag um, when there are communication breakdowns in the system. Well, I will pause there. 
Thank you, Rachel. We have about 13 minutes for questions and answers with our speakers. If you've not already done so, please submit questions via the Q&A box. Um, and at this time, I'd like all of our speakers to rejoin us on the screen. Um, my first question um, was going to be about transparency because most patients won't know if they've been impacted by a benefit manager's decision. Um, and so do, but listening to Rachel, it makes me think that increased transparency isn't necessarily going to help patients because they're already having multiple different uh, people to talk to, to try to rectify some of the, the binds that they find themselves in when they're having problems accessing because of uh, you know, determinations made by these benefit, benefit managers. Um, and if, if increased transparency um, isn't a way to, to help solve some of this, um, what, what are some ways that we can make it uh, possible for patients to get guideline concordant care um, especially when we hear that some of the laboratory benefit managers are only um, offering, are only changing their guidelines every six months. And we know that the, the increase in innovations in cancer is happening very quickly. So um, Greg, I'm gonna start with you and ask you, what do you see as ways that we can improve the patient experience um, in accessing care when that access has been impacted by a benefit manager's decision? Thanks, Claire. I appreciate the question. Um, I think it's really valuable to look at this through the patient experience. Um, and so I think, you know, when these uh, UM practices are set up and, you know, services are targeted for various UM or prior authorization, is one thing kind of like as a concept, but then how is it implemented in practice? And, and I think, you know, that creates a lot of abrasion. And this is where I think you see a lot of these, you know, barriers to treatment and care. And I think, you know, hearing these patient stories is really important because the value of UM and prior authorization, you know, only makes sense if they're aligned with clinical best practices and, and practice-based guidelines and the scientific evidence and the, and the, um, you know, the medical evidence. If they're not, if they're used as a cross containment tool, you know, that's frankly, that's an inappropriate use of UM and should not should not be used in that way. It's really about making sure the patient gets the be most best care based on kind of the, the best, you know, clinical guidelines that are available. I think, you know, looking at solutions, I do think, you know, transparency is an important piece of this. I think for many stakeholders, you know, UM is almost like a little bit like a black box, and there's a lot of confusion about, you know, is there common criteria as to how it's applied? Is there variation between plans and how they apply it? And that creates also friction, friction with providers because it increases their burden um, in caring for their patient population. So I do think transparency is, is an important piece of this. And I think, uh, you know, electronic prior authorization is an important piece of this. Uh, there's no reason why these things have to go through paperwork and faxes. And, um, you know, I think that's really a low hanging fruit and really to expedite these decisions. Um, so I think that's another important piece of this is that, you know, for services that are routinely approved, you know, we need a real time kind of adjudication of it. Um, and so those are a couple of things that I think you know, could make a difference. Um, you know, from, from a BMA perspective, we do believe there is value to UM and PA, but only if it's applied in, in a way that's like clinically appropriate, uh, aligned with best medical practices, you know, and does not place barriers on patient access. Adam, do you have other solutions? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? I think that the, there's transparency that needs to happen between the clinician and the patient. Um, there's clearly some additional transparency between the benefit manager and the clinician, right? We see that often where there's just no clear guideline as to what that particular benefit manager or the payer that, you know, even 
the different payers that they manage the benefit for could have different guidelines and policies. And so it's really difficult for the clinician to know what is covered by this payer and what criteria does this patient have to meet to, to get that test or that treatment or whatever it is. Um, so that's something I agree with Greg that, you know, the kind of real time uh, uh, transparency of this information, the real time electronic authorizations that can sort of happen rather than still dealing with faxes and phone calls and, you know, peer to peers, right? That, that will still happen on occasion, but if we can make it an electronic process, then that's, it's really going to improve uh, the process for the physician and then their communication that will improve their communication with the patient especially if they can understand what's going to be covered while the patient is still in the office, right? That they don't have to follow up with them. So that's a really key part. And I think lab testing is also a little bit different, right? Usually if a, a physician is talking to a patient, they usually say, hey, I th I'm going to put you on this medication, or I think you're a candidate for this surgery. When you go to the doctor's office, do they always say, you know, I'm going to order the, this test and this test and this test? Not always. So the patient doesn't always know exactly what's being ordered for them. And so I think that's something where the physician-patient communication and having the patient sort of armed in advance with, hey, are there any genetic tests you're gonna order for me? You know, and really sort of helping to get the clinician thinking um, and communicating back to the patient is, is also you know, really important. But yeah, I agree with Greg. I think you know, electronic authorization, real-time authorization is really, is really key. So I think one of the things Adam just mentioned is real-time communication in the context of while the patient is still in the provider's office, right? And I think that is extremely important, especially when we're talking about, um, about prescription drugs, right? Because you've got extra players involved there um, that often are requiring an in-person visit to, if you're going, if you're taking a prescription from your provider and going to the CVS um, and filling that prescription, you know, there's a lot of time and, and effort involved in that, only to hear from the CVS that your prescription was denied. Does the pharmacist know why? Usually, um, usually the answer is, is you have to stand another line and talk to somebody else so that they can look it up in the, in the system and try to figure it out. They may or may not try to resolve it from the pharmacy, but chances are you're gonna have to go back and call your provider. As a patient trying to get in touch with a provider, when you're not in the office in front of them, it is incredibly frustrating. Providers are very busy. Um, and so generally you have to call, leave a message and wait for that person to call you back. Um, and when they call you back, if you are not available with your phone to talk with them, the second that they call, they're gonna leave a message for you and you have to start the whole process over again. So I think that you're right, that real-time communication where providers have better information about what is covered by that particular patient's insurance. Historically, providers know very little about what an individual patient's insurance plan covers and or requires. Um, and so they are operating based on, you know, their best understanding of the best treatment for this patient, but, the inter but they haven't taken those, the, the next step of saying, now I need to figure out what this patient can afford. Right? What does their insurance cover? What is the co-payment for that? Um, you know, what are the what are the utilization management processes? That's really up to the patient to figure out after they've left the provider's office. Um, and so I do think that there's a lot that could be achieved by better communication now that we have the internet um, and that you know more providers are getting more plugged into it. Um, that you know things have come a long way but we still have a lot further that we could go that would um, create that sort of real-time communication across the board and behind the scenes so that the patient doesn't have to become an expert on these very complicated systems. Thanks, Rachel. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so maybe what I'll do is go around and ask you Analyst, if there's one last thing that you want to make sure get said before we end. Greg, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Claire. I uh, really appreciate the discussion here and being part of this, uh, you know, very, very distinguished panel experts. Um, I think, yeah, I got, I certainly got a lot from it. 
I think, you know, just in closing this out, you know, just to reiterate, I, we really do believe there is value to these tools, but, um, you know, there's also a lot of issues that need to be addressed as well. And so, you know, from a BMA perspective, we strongly support efforts to streamline and simplify the, the prior authorization process as well as other UM. I think, you know, really need to look at the patient perspective here. If there are procedures and processes that are, you know, placing barriers to needed care, they need to be addressed. Um, and, um, you know, I think whether it's through, you know, making a, the process electronic, uh, doing this real-time decision-making, um, I think these are important steps forward so that these tools can be used appropriately, which is discourage, you know, low value uh, care that could be potentially wasteful or even harmful, but while ensuring access to, to high quality and, and medically necessary care. Adam? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, ACLA has supported the Timely Access for, for Care to Seniors Act um, to improve some of these processes. Again, that's, that's limited to Medicare Advantage. So I do think there needs to be more oversight. There's been a lot of state, uh, state laws passed to oversee uh, pharmacy benefit managers in the last, say, five years. But there's really not a lot of regulatory oversight of other benefit managers like labs, like radiology. Even radiation therapy is now being managed. So from a cancer patient's perspective, right, if you're eligible for radiation therapy, is that going to impact your treatment there? And so I do think there needs to be more regulation to make sure that these services are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is uh, you know, uh, allowing access to the right care uh, to the patient at the right time and not overburdening clinicians and patients with uh, sort of unnecessary processes in our healthcare system. And Rachel, I'll give you the last word here. <laughs> um, there's been so much change in our healthcare system in the past decade, um, and really even in the last five years, right, that there's been an immense, the, the, the incredible rise of PBMs, now LBMs, um, the, the, the consolidation of health insurance plans, um, the vertical integration of insurance plans with provider networks, with the benefit managers, has, I think, created a really changing landscape that um, at the end of the day has a lot of very powerful corporate interests um, making decisions that the patient is sort of bearing the brunt of. Um, all too often. And the patient voice, I think, really gets lost in a lot of these conversations. Um, and it's sort of one thing to say we need to do it to make sure that the patient gets the best care that they can. I think we all agree on that point. Um, but I think we need to do a better job of, of really evaluating what the patient experience is and trying to solve for that um, in this process of, of uh, you know, really recreating our healthcare system um, in the way that it has been over the past few years. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, many thanks to Adam, Greg, and Rachel for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, this re the recording of this event will be posted at, on Cancer Support Community's website and mailed out to our grassroots network. And we'll also include a blog that links to some of these solutions that were being talked about, um, especially for Medicare Advantage. Um, but this is something that we need to have further discussions on and figure out how do we find better solutions for all patients. So I want to also um, thank our Forum on Utilization Management sponsors, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, GSK, Janssen Oncology, Novartis, Merck, Pfizer, and Sanofi. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Please reach out to the Cancer Policy Institute at action at cancersupportcommunity.org if you have any questions. Thanks again. Thank you.